A very warm welcome to this webinar titled An EU Regulation Affecting Companies Worldwide. The regulation we'll be talking about is the EU General Data Protection Regulation, otherwise known as GDPR. Uh, with a focus on markets outside the EU, today's webinar is relevant for all companies that sell to, work with or hire EU citizens. My name is Danny and I'll be assisting Florian in the background today and before we get started there's just a few things I want to make you aware of. Uh, the first is that you can join the conversation on our Twitter handles displayed on the screen at any time also after the webinar. Your phone lines and computer mics are muted but of course we do encourage you to ask any questions in the question panel of GoToWebinar. The, today's webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes so it includes Q&A at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'll hand it over to Florian, who will begin by going through today's agenda. Florian. Thank you, Danny. So off we go. Um, we've got some ground to cover. Um, and we'll be starting with um, you know, explaining what the GDPR is, um, followed right by explaining two um, important concepts uh, or weddings, which is the data controller versus the data processor. When it comes to GDPR, we'll be talking about um, requirements for collecting, storing, and processing personal data, and also what personal data means. Um, we'll be looking at the rights of data subjects, so um, in essence, persons of whom you store personal data. Um, we'll be especially looking at the difference of how things like registering for a newsletter worked until uh, the GDPR comes into effect and how it has to work after that, uh, including all obligations to inform uh, persons about what you're doing with the data. Um, we'll cover even more obligations than just the obligations, obligations of information, um, followed by covering a couple of broader topics um, than just kind of all the legal requirements. Um, speaking a bit, little bit about uh, the difference between single source of truth versus multiple sources of the truth, so the SSOT versus MSOT. Um, and then we'll be covering what you know a data breach uh, could actually be or what the, the root cause for a possible data breach could be. And lastly, we have one slide covering on how Penagenda can help. Um, in essence, we don't want to make this kind of uh, marketing or, or product presentation. This is all about GDPR. Um, at the very end, uh, we'll also be showing two slides of resources where you can do further reading on the topic, if of interest. And then lastly, um, we'll be moving into a Q&A. Um, again, feel free to jot down questions uh, in the question panel of GoToWebinar uh, or jot them down on paper um, for the very end. We're going fairly fast paced here uh, because the topic is uh, fairly broad. Um, so forgive the fast speaking and um, the lots of text. So the GDPR um, is short for General Data Protection Regulation. Um, in Europe, uh, the wording would be EU um, DSGVO, um, short for EU Datenschutzgrundverordnung, and EU again is short for European Union. So the longest word would be uh, European Union Datenschutzgrundverordnung. Um, so whenever you read GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, DSGVO, EU DSGVO, or Datenschutzgrundverordnung, doesn't really matter. All of that is essentially the same. It becomes effective on May 25, so that's not uh, all too long to go and is designed to protect the citizens of the European Union and their personal data. That in essence means that the GDPR applies to any organization worldwide collecting, storing, or processing personal data of EU citizens. That by itself also implies if you're offering a service um, from outside of the European Union um, for citizens of the European Union or businesses in the European Union that again store personal data of EU citizens um, in your service that that applies just as much. Now let's first define um, the different types of data that the GDPR um, is all about. First of all it's about any personal data relating to a person. So that can be an email address, uh, first name, last name, IP address, color of hair, anything. Um, um, naturally, if you were to just collect um, the information um, of everybody's color of hair without a name and anything, then it's not really data relating to a person, um, but just kind of uh, collecting statistical data uh, that's not personal per se. Uh, 
an email address by itself, irregardless of whether it is first name or last name um, or similar, um, already is relating to a person because it clearly identifies a person behind that email address. There are different ways to look at personal data when it comes to the data of employees inside of organizations and working with that. That makes it a little bit difficult to um, kind of blend between when is it personal data, when is this just, you know, uh, business to business, uh, things like that. Um, we'll stick to as many processes where this is about, in the end, you have data about an EU citizen who, yes, might be working at another company, but still um, you have the personal data. There's a second thing in the GDPR which is called sensitive data, um, in essence kind of uh, more dangerous or more sent more difficult uh, data like genetic data, biometric data, sex life, health, racial or ethnic origin, trade union membership, social security numbers, bank account numbers and stuff like that. Um, all of that is sensitive. Um, we'll be focusing on personal data because that is kind of the root cause for the GDPR. Um, typically around sensitive data there is much more sensitivity um, uh, around that and a lot more processes in, in place. You could also say that if you find complying to GDPR around personal data already quite challenging after we've been through the presentation, then it doesn't get easier with sensitive data. Now, before we further move on, uh, let me clearly state that I am not a lawyer. So um, the purpose of this session is to uh, give you kind of the uh, summary of the 84 paragraphs that the GDPR is comprised um, of. So it's got tons of pages, tons of text, um, and this is the 60-minute breakdown. Um, we could have also tried and make this kind of the 10-minute breakdown. There are some very good visualizations on GDPR, but in all honesty, I started with those to understand the topic myself, and then it took me reading the entire um, legislation and understand it to actually make sense of the simplified version. So the 60 minute is the one that we're going for. The GDPR um, is far from easy. Uh, it depends on the type of data that we're talking about. We just talked about personal versus sensitive data, so we'll be, we'll be fo focusing on personal. It depends on the type of organization that you are, so whether you're kind of a business or a bank or an insurance or um, um, a government on a part, and we'll be focusing on the business aspect of this. Um, typically, bank, insurance, government um, have it either a little bit harder uh, on the bank and insurance side or a little bit easier on the government side. Also worth noting, other laws may extend or overrule GDPR. So as a very simple example, if um, a person would buy something from you, so you'd be Amazon, for example, you'd be selling them a product, um, then there's one particular right under GDPR where um, every person has the right to be forgotten. So a person could send you an email and say, I want to be forgotten and delete it from all data that you have about me, including archives and backups and anything. Now, from a legal perspective, you are required to document that purchase transaction for a um, number of years. Um, and that overrules GDPR per se, so in that case, a person would not have the right to have their data deleted. However, if you have somebody registering for a newsletter um, and they want to be removed from that, then yes, most probably all companies have an unsubscribe process in place, uh, but there's other very interesting things that happen as soon as GDPR comes in place. Next, GDPR may be different from country to country. However, it's important to note that countries cannot weaken the GDPR. They can make it stronger um, or kind of add to it, um, but they cannot um, say, you know, some of the paragraphs aren't relevant to us, so we'll make stuff a lot easier uh, in our country. There's one possible exception to this, which is the level of penalty um, as soon as stuff goes to court. Now, there's two things where things can go to court at some point in time um, that have fines attached to it. And one is if you do not comply with the responsibilities of the GDPR, and they are quite massive, um, which are independent of whether there's a data breach, a data being lost, a data being made public that should have stayed disclosed, that if you do not comply with the regulations of the GDPR, independent of a data breach, fines can be as high as 10 million euro or 2% of worldwide turnover whatever is higher of those two. So uh, if 2% of worldwide turn turnover is higher, think of Apple, then most probably 2% hurts more than 10 million. And then in case there is a data breach, then fines can go up as high as 20 million euro or 4% of worldwide turnover. Before GDPR, um, typically uh, fines in 
Germany would have been between 50,000 and 300,000 euros. Um, yes, with some exceptions, but that was typically kind of uh, where fines would be, uh, plus uh, potentially up to two years of jail. Uh, two years of jail still apply um, uh, in addition to GDPR in Germany after the GDPR will become effective. But as you can see, uh, there's quite a massive difference between 300,000 and 10 million uh, or 2% of worldwide turnover. So the responsibilities are of utmost importance. And it's not like you could look at this in the future like um, companies have often in the past and saying, well, as long as nothing happens and there's no data breach, then there's nothing to worry about. Then you still have to worry about fines of up to 10 million. I'll also turn this around into a, um, a lighter interpretation, which is I'm sure that if you do your very best to protect data and work properly with data, then you won't end up in court most probably with a fine of um, 10 million or 2% of worldwide turnover, but have lower fines first. But the moment that um, an authority would discover that you're not taking this seriously, then they'll most probably go for the higher end. Um, another thing to note is that the GDPR does not apply to exclusively personal or family, family, uh, fam familial uh, activity. So um, naturally, if you, I don't know, somewhere store the data of family men members uh, to have their passport numbers ready for when you're traveling and stuff like that, then you don't have to worry about securing all that data. Um, so as long as it's, it's just about you um, in your kind of private life between uh, private people, then um, GDPR does not apply. As soon as the GDPR becomes effective, um, every organization affected by it requires one or multiple data protection officers. Yes, every organization most probably has a data protection officer, although I'd uh, be tempted to say that the larger ones most probably will have one, the smaller ones may not have one. Um, very small ones in Germany um, with less than 250 employees do not necessarily need, need one. However, I would by all means recommend them to have one because they still have to meet the obligations of the GDPR. And it's very difficult to meet them if you don't have somebody who takes care of all those topics. Also, GDPR requires one or multiple people to be responsible for personal data. Now, that's on city, you could say, well, that's what the data protection officer uh, kind of is all about. But later on, uh, you will um, see that if somebody registers for a newsletter um, with your company, that you have to communicate to them who is going to handle and work with that data. So, and that most probably isn't the data protection officer. One more thing, once again, sorry for all the text. What you can see here is the picture of a great infographic that is uh, linked to in the resource section. You will get this presentation at the very end by email. Um, so you can then look uh, that infographic up by yourself. It's just very, very hard to condense all the legal stuff um, into just uh, you know pictures without kind of losing the important stuff. And um, I've read quite some legal stuff in my life. The GDPR is actually fairly, okay to read, uh, not really difficult. It is extremely precise, so every single word you might want to leave out makes a difference. Um, but it's um, one of those legal texts where you don't have to read a sentence 20 times to actually grasp uh, what it's trying to say. So they are leading by example of what um, companies have to do by themselves, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, two further um, important things about the GPR are the differentiation between the so-called data controller and the data processor. Um, the controller um, is the legal person or um, corporate body that determines the purposes and means of the processing of personal data. That just means you collect data for sending out a newsletter, like email addresses, and it's your organization that then determines this is collected for sending an, a newsletter, so the purpose, and then the means um, you know, um, for essentially informing um, prospects, customers, um, business uh, relationships with certain topics. The processor, on the other hand, is um, the legal person or the corporate body that processes the personal data on behalf of the controller. So once you've gotten people to register for a newsletter, where the controller could be, for example, the marketing department or someone in the marketing department, uh, the processor in the end could also be the marketing department and sending it out, but it could also be a person that is just in charge of uh, once a month uh, taking those email lists and uploading them somewhere else. Where this becomes much more important is when you look at cloud services. Um, in a cloud situation, the data controller um, is kind of your organization or employees in your organization because they determine the purpose and the means of the processing. 
And the processor is in essence the cloud provider, but only if the provider the, the data is properly encrypted in that service. So as a simple example, you move to IBM Cloud or Microsoft Cloud, um, all your data. If um, overstretching, nobody at Microsoft or IBM can ever read any of the emails, any of the data, because it's encrypted and only you have the key to that data, um, then Microsoft or IBM would be the data processor and you would be the controller. The moment that that data would be readable by all means um, to IBM or Microsoft, even if it were, you know, just be in part, then um, those cloud providers would also take in part the role of the data controller. Now, the other important thing here is that the data processor must be GDPR compliant too. So, if you have anything in the cloud already are thinking about moving to the cloud, make sure that any of the third parties that you work with, which could be the big names like IBM and Microsoft, or it could be Salesforce, MailChimp, uh, Hootsuite, uh, I'm not trying to say those aren't big names, um, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, that you share data with, you as an organization have the obligation to make sure that all these third parties are GDPR compliant. It's not their problem alone. You can't just say if they aren't, then it's their problem. It is your obligation under the GDPR to make sure that every service inside the EU, outside of your organization, outside of the EU is GDPR compliant. And that's massive. Now, if you wonder which organizations are GDPR compliant, then for example, in the United States, there's something um, there, that's provided by the Department of Commerce, um, where you can look up companies certified for the so-called EU European Union Privacy Shield. Uh, I'll be sharing the link later in the resource section, where you can then see is whatever uh, organization you share data with um, that is from European citizens, um, is that registered for the EU Privacy Shield. Many of those companies, um, pretty much all of the, the above that I noted here, have their own blogs also on GDPR and are stating whether they are ready, when they are ready, and similar things. Now, moving on, um, when you're thinking about processing, collecting, storing um, personal data, it must be for specified, explicit, and legitimate purposes. Um, and that sounds silly um, by means of, you know, well, Hasn't that always been the case? Um, this will become much more concrete on the next, uh, on the following pages, where we're talking about the obligations that every organization has when collecting personal data from EU citizens. To collect data from an EU citizen with a GDPR that requires content of the data subject, so the person, um, unless it's necessary to, uh, you know, for the performance of a contract. So. Um, I don't know, if you're selling something like a car uh, to a person and you need their address and bank account number and whatever, then you don't necessarily need their consent. It's um, all necessary to perform the contract um, to get that data from them. So um, that doesn't require consent per se. Um, another exception to this would be if you have to be compliant with a legal obligation. So you are required to collect certain data from somebody to make sure that um, they, you know, can get credit or stuff like that, where you need more data, then that doesn't require necessarily the consent, but you have to comply with other legal obligations. Um, the next exception would be protecting a person's vital interests. So this is most probably for police and uh, other parts of government bodies um, where they can't just wait for consent, but they uh, have to collect data to protect a person's vital interests or another person's vital interests. Um, next on the list would be a task in the public interest. Think of, um, you know, in public areas like train stations or airports, uh, there's video surveillance. Nobody's asking for your consent uh, to, you know, tape you on video. It's a necessity. It's in the, uh, it's in public interest. And I know there's, there's a touch, discussion to be had whether video surveillance is in public interest, but that's not the point I'm trying to make here. Um, lastly, um, if there is legitimate interest in collecting that data. Yes, that is kind of a little bit of a blurry point, um, but uh, we'll get to some of that um, later on as well. Now, very importantly, when collecting data, it must be minimized to only the necessary extent. Think of, again, people registering for a newsletter where sometimes companies ask for what's your postal code, uh, your uh, address, or your first and last name or whatever. 
technically, it's not necessary to understand whether somebody is male or female. Yes, it's nice to um, send somebody in uh, a newsletter and saying Mr. versus Mrs. or whatever, so and talking to them personally. But the question is, is it really necessary to send out the newsletter? That's obviously a discussion to be had, but I'm sure there's a lot of data you can imagine that is not necessary to collect, which from the point on where GDPR becomes effective, you are no longer allowed to even collect. So reviewing what all you is being collected today um, uh, is not only a good idea, but a necessity. The data that you collect must be correct. Now that again sounds silly because uh, somebody could fill in wrong stuff. Um, the point is that you have to regularly review whether you have stored incorrect data. And there's possible different meanings for incorrect. Incorrect doesn't just mean it's the wrong email uh, address. Um, incorrect can mean um, you know, it's not le legitimate to have it um, because in the past GDPR wasn't effective, so you could pro possibly collect more data um, or certain data that you no longer are allowed to collect. If that's the case, you have to delete it. Um, also, if the data is not necessary, so think of again, you collected postal code in the past um, and in the future it's not necessary, you are obligated by GDPR to delete that data. Whenever we're talking about deleting, um, the GDPR clearly states that it has to be fully deleted. It's not just in the active system, but you have to also delete it in backups and in archives. This is going to be a very interesting um, thing to watch in the next couple of months, two years. Lastly, if it's wrong, so that's the typical definition of correct versus incorrect, then you can either correct it, so you make sure that the information um, is right, or if you do not do that, because you don't have the time or don't want to maintain the data, you're obliged to delete it. Moving on, um, as soon as the GDPR becomes uh, effective, all EU citizens have the following rights. First of all, they have the right that their data is processed only after they have given consent. And giving consent has to be freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous. That means you can no longer have a registration form for a newsletter that has opt-in already checked. Uh, it has to be explicitly given by that person. Um, and um, so that's important there. It has to be informed, and we'll get to that on the next slide, where there's a ton of stuff that you have to inform people about, even when they just register for a newsletter. As a side note here, I'm just using the example of registering for a newsletter because it's easy to understand. That doesn't mean um, if you don't have processes touching personal data, um, you know, around registering for newsletters, that it doesn't apply for you. It applies even more around uh, other processes than it does for that. Every EU citizen also has the right of information, um, meaning that you could then write an email to Facebook and ask them, what data do you store about me and where? And what do you do with that data? We'll get to details on the next slide. Now, some organizations will argue you could do that already today, yesterday, um, so even before the GDPR becomes effective. There is an elephant in the room here, which is until the GDPR becomes effective, every company can choose to some extent how they treat the personal data and which of the processes they would tell a person of where they store information. From the moment that the GDPR becomes effective by law, they have to kind of tell the person where all personal information lives about that person. And I'm fairly certain that in every large organization, personal data doesn't just live in the systems where you store them um, in the first place, like a central system like SAP or a SQL database or a CRM or whatever, but data leaves those systems by email, forwarding, downloading, spreading it on local machines or whatever, and that's the big elephant in the room here. The next right is the right of rectification, so you can write an email to a company saying, I want my data to be corrected. The next one is the right of erasure, um, also very often talked about as the right to be forgotten. So you can write an email to Twitter or Facebook and say, I want to be forgotten. That is different from just deleting your profile. It means that Facebook and Twitter then have to fully erase any knowledge of you as an identifiable person from all their storage, all. And that's massive. And I do think that um, there's a big risk that that is taken too lightly. Next is the right of restriction. So you could write an email to a company and saying, um, you have too much data about me and I want you um, to actually reduce it down to the 
necessary part. Typically, you would most probably start with the right of information, what you store about me, then you discover they have your shoe size and your um, color of hair, and then you say, I'd like you to remove certain data. The next one is a massively interesting one, which is the right of data portability. So uh, think of that in the context of cloud. When you subscribe to a service um, like Facebook or whatever, at some point you could not just say delete me, but you could say I want all my data uh, to then transport it to a different service. That could also apply for other stuff. That does not mean that um, when you export, I don't know, all your email from Microsoft and would want to import it uh, into an IBM cloud, that they will have to support the same format. Uh, but that means um, that you have to have the ability to take all your data to then give it to someone else and see um, how that best works in actually importing it. The next is the right of objection. So rather than uh, saying I want myself deleted, you could say um, I object to you actually having my data or that amount of data, not yet taking any action. So it's kind of uh, just making sure that you have all the options um, from um, just getting information to being deleted and everything in between. The last one is also an interesting one, um, which is the right not to be subject to um, exclusively automated decision making. That just means that um, the moment that you share your personal data, whether through consent or because of performing a contract or whatever, that in the end, a machine, a computer may not make an automatic decision on the data submitted. That still means that a machine could make a recommendation and a human being would then review it and say, yeah, I'm okay with what the machine said, but it is not allowed that any machine in any particular context just makes an automatic decision, like I don't know, firing people based on measure measurements uh, or similar things. Further on, let's stick with this example of registering for a newsletter. So in the past, you would register for a newsletter. Um, in some cases, when registering for a newsletter, so having this box where you enter your email address, it may link to a, a, a page where it uh, tells you stuff about how the company handles privacy, data privacy and stuff. But and typically, you would enter your email address, and then you would say, thank you for registering uh, for our newsletter. That's what you would get. Or in a contract, uh, there would be this, you know, we need your email address, uh, and we'll make sure that we store it safely. Now, what happens when the GDPR comes into place is that you have to communicate in concise, uh, concise, transparent, intelligible, and easily accessible form using clear and plain language. Um, what you're doing with that data and a ton more. And that's what we're coming on, on the next slide and it's mind boggling. Whenever I look at all these requirements, uh, my head is screaming and wants to say, it can't really be that difficult, it can't really be that much. As a private or as a citizen of the EU, I think this is massive and great and protecting my own interests as uh, in a similar role or a different role, like being the CEO of Pan Agenda, it's a pain. And, but there's very little, if any, room to make this any easier and say, I only think it's relevant if there's a data breach or I don't know, whatever. So I can imagine that this is difficult for you, um, but uh, it's been difficult for me like for the past three, four weeks uh, where I've spent a ton of time to go through all of this. <clears throat> now, when you collect personal data, you have to inform the person that you collect this data from um, about the name and contact details of the responsible person um, slash entity. I don't think entity is really valid here. So it's not enough that if you were to register for a Pen Agenda newsletter that we would say, uh, you can contact Pen Agenda, here's the address and the phone number, and then when you call, uh, you you know get the receptionist and then want to exercise your right to be forgotten. The receptionist most probably can't really do anything with that request. So you have to have a person that is responsible for um, the data that is being collected. You have to tell the person the contact details of the data protection officer. Again, you can't just take the receptionist or whatever, but you specifically have to make clear to the person, here's how you can contact the data protection, protection officer. Next, you have to communicate the purpose of the data processing and its legal basis. Um, the purpose of the data processing would usually be any um, paragraph in Article 6 I'm specifically referring to that uh, because when I first was wondering, so how how would you communicate the legal basis of collecting an email address for a newsletter? That is very simple. In Article 6, there's one provision, um, which is 1A, that says you're okay to collect that data if a person freely agrees to um, have you process that data. So the legal basis for newsletter email registrations would be Article 6, 1A. 
just to pick a second uh, paragraph from this article, uh, 1F, that would be collecting the data because there's a legitimate interest, then you have to communicate to the person what the legitimate interest is um, that is pursued by the controller or by a third party. Uh, in a similar sense, you would have to communicate um, if the reason is for performance of a contract. So that you have to make clear what the reason is for why you're collecting that data and what the purpose is also describing what you're going to do with it. We are going to send newsletters. The next, you have to um, communicate the recipients or categories of recipients. To make that more clear, the recipient could be one or multiple people, but it could also be the HR department or the marketing department, uh, something like that as the category. And you have to co suddenly communicate that to that. So I just filled in, I'd like to register for the newsletter, here's my email address, and then you have to tell me all this and a, and a bunch more. Um, the next thing that you have to clearly state is um, if you intend to transfer personal data to a third country or international organization. So registering for a newsletter with PenAgenda, um, we use MailChimp services, which is registered under the EU Privacy Shield, but we have to make clear that we intend to transfer the personal data to a third country because MailChimp operates in the United States. <clears throat> then you have to communicate for what period you will store that personal data, or if that is not possible because there's no known best before date, um, like a newsletter was go until somebody subscribes, then you have to explain what the criteria is to determine that period. The next thing that you have to make clear is that uh, it is the person's right to lodge a complaint with the supervisory authority, um, which is typically inside of the European Union. That on its own is massive. I, I'm very excited to see what ways of communications organizations choose, latest May 25, when you register for a newsletter. And what you can't do, given the precise and clear language or whatever that we saw at the uh, previous slide, is you can't just hide that in the general terms and conditions. So you can't just link to one page that is eight miles long and somewhere in on page seven it says, well, this is you know what we're all obliged to tell you, but you have to make this easy to access, easy to understand, and as concise as we're listing it here. Moving on, and yes, sorry, this is a ton of text, I'll just be picking the most important stuff. Um, you have to tell them that they have the right from the controller to access their information, to have it corrected, to have it deleted, um, and um, to also restrict the processing, all of what we learned earlier as being the rights of EU citizens. This very much reminds me when flying from Europe to the United States and you have to fill in the form, have you ever convicted a crime? The same exists if you travel from uh, the US and into the European Union. And you often ask yourself, so why on earth do I actually have to tell who would say, yes, I've convicted a crime? Well, most probably no one. The point of this is that in case you have convicted a crime and somebody detects it and they can then tell you that you uh, actually didn't tell them the truth is that you just committed two crimes. So that makes prosecution much more secure on that end and you're by complying to these obligations towards the data subject, you are implicitly also making it clear that you understand what your own obligations are. So it's no longer like, you know, um, if nobody sues us, then we'll just wait until something happens or if there's no data breach. But you are telling everybody who will register for your services or stuff like that, that you are complying with those laws. The next one is where the processing is based on freely given content and there's more to this. So I'm trying to kind of streamline this. Uh, you have to tell them that they have the right to withdraw. Again, you have to tell them all that explicitly. So as much as this is clear to me and you and we could all agree once you've read this, well, wouldn't this be enough? No. When people register for a newsletter, you have to tell them all this. The next one is whether the provision of personal data is statutory or a contractual requirement. Uh, and there's more to this, uh, but again, you have to just say, um, you know, how are you and on what reason are you actually collecting this data? And then you uh, have to tell them in case automated decision making is taking place. You have to explicitly tell them that. Um, and that also means that in case you are using automated decision making, what logic is involved, um, what the significance of that logic is, and what possible consequences of that particular logic is. And there's a blurring um, topic here, which um, in, in many cases when collecting personal data, some of that data is um, used by a machine to then determine, you know, will forward it either to team A or to team B. That by itself is automated decision making. <clears throat> 
um, it isn't necessarily profiling per se, um, but it is a way of decision making. Further on, um, obligations of data collectors. So this again distinguishes between uh, someone offering a cloud service provided they use proper encryption and stuff. There's more obligations for an organization that collects um, personal data. First of all, they have to inform all recipients with which personal data was shared of corrected or deleted personal data. So someone approaches the organization says, I want to exercise my right to be forgotten. I want you to delete anything you have about me. You have to then delete all the data about that person, unless there's reason not to do so, but if you have to delete that data, you have to do it internally across archives, backups, the entire systems, and you have to inform any recipients that you have shared that data with in the past. Internally, that means if you forwarded an email to 10 people and you don't know whether they downloaded this stuff onto a local laptop, you have to inform them. Externally, that means if you share data with a business partner, a third party or something else, or whatever, you have to inform them that that person wanted to be deleted and it is your obligation to make sure that the other party is informed of that too, to carry that forward. This is massive. The next one is that you have the obligation to inform the data subject of such recipients if they request to be informed. So if somebody exercises the right of information and says, what do you store about me and where do you store it and how, you then have to tell them with which recipients you share that data. That could be MailChimp, it could be a business partner, it could be anything. In turn, this means if you turn this question around, you have to know for every particular process where you touch, collect, store, process personal data, when that might lead to sharing of data to later on be again in control of that data. This is massive. So it's not enough to say, you know, we'll delete it wherever we can and all will be good. No, you're obliged to document those processes. And by the way, we'll get to that as well. Larger organizations um, have to maintain records of processing activities. So for every process that touches personal data, you're obliged to maintain a record of here's where personal data is collected, stored, processed, whatever. Next one is the obligation to inform authorities in case of a data breach. So this, this is the first time that we're now talking about a data breach, the, the oh my God, um, now things really went bad. Up until now, we haven't even talked about a data breach. We've just talked about handling personal data. If there is a data breach, you are required to inform authorities within 72 hours. That is within 72 hours of the incident, which bears the question of, well, what if you don't discover it within 72 hours? There's a ton of stuff in GDPR that requires you to do your very best, and that, that is more difficult to explain, so don't just take it with a smile, well, your very best, let's all do our very best. It's not meant that way, that you ideally will always identify if there is a data breach. <clears throat> Next, in general, and that comes naturally, you have to ensure the security of personal data. We've all been there in the past that, yes, we don't take personal data lightly. First of all, the scope of personal data to me is broader in the GDPR because I would have always said, well, personal data, really that's, I don't know, if I have the birth date or stuff like that. No, it's any data relating to a person. So also an address or an email address or an IP address. <clears throat> Next, you have to make data protection by design and by default a principle. Uh, those are things like uh, don't have opt-in checked. That comes through the other stuff we talked about already, but there's a fundamental section in GDPR saying you have to implement data protection by design and by default. Data has to be protected by default and not optionally or only if people read the fine print or only if nobody complains. No, um, this is um, a default obligation. We've talked about the maintaining records of processing activities. That is for companies um, that are uh, at 250 employees or larger, okay? Um, the next thing, in case of high risk, and this is again one of those blurry zones, uh, high risk could mean many things. It's obviously a difference if you lose the personal data of one person versus a thousand. I'm not trying, trying to take anybody's data lightly, but the amount of data makes a difference. 20,000 credit card records is, is a different than one. Um, high risk sensitive data is a big difference to personal data. So biometric, um, sex life and stuff like that, uh, that's definitely high risk. Whenever we're talking about high risk, you have to do a so-called data protection impact assessment. Um, and you can read up on that 
somewhere else, the larger your organization and the more data you process, uh, the more likely it is you have to do one. And you also have to do a prior consultation, uh, consultation with authorities from the European Union. The next thing that you're required to have is codes of conduct. So how do you actually um, approach personal data uh, independent of maintaining records of processing, just in general, um, putting codes of conduct, conduct in place and you have to monitor them. So you can't just write them down and say, well, you know, this is it, cool, done it. But you have to make sure that they are constantly applied. And I'd add to that, they have to be state of the art and they have to be um, fairly strict, which we'll cover in just a bit. Now, the next thing, uh, and I'm just repeating this here, um, again, don't forget the, you know, having to inform authorities in case of a data leak, don't take that one lightly as well. This is the 20 million thing. Um, and that's not, if you don't inform authorities, that's the leak itself. Uh, and then things just pile up. Um, where, let me also state that in case there is a data breach and there is harm being done to EU citizens, there are fines that come on top of the before mentioned 10 to 20 million. So EU citizens then have the right to sue for, I don't know, personal loss, whatever that may mean in the context of stuff. Next thing, an organization must prove that they did everything possible slash feasible to prevent a leak. I'm adding the feasible because you're not being asked to now buy a firewall for every laptop and you're not being asked to lock everybody up in a cupboard and nobody is allowed to leave the room. You don't have to prevent anybody from sending any emails at all. That wouldn't be feasible in any way, shape or form. However, you have to document it. You can't just say, I did everything that I could uh, and, you know, um, look a bit... Um, like, you know, asking for pity, um, you have to document what all you did um, around securing personal data across all processes. What that blends into is very obviously the entire security topic. That's the one that um, I'm, quote, least worried about, quote, because I'm not really worried about the security topic per se. Most organizations have good security measures to make sure that no data is lost, that data is protected. Um, the much bigger elephant in the room here is the documentation. Where is what? Uh, understanding what is accessible by whom? What is accessed by whom? And you not only have to document that in case of a data breach or a leak or a hack, but authorities have every right to, from time to time, control that. Some organizations even have the requirement to get certified um, around GDPR. Um, and that, again, means that you have to have a clear understanding of where all in your organization is personal data. And I'm fairly sure that the typical culture in many organizations is well, it's wherever it has to be, um, whenever it has to be, like, you know, people forward emails, store attachments somewhere, and then store them somewhere else, download it seven times, et cetera, et cetera. And that means you have to work on the entire culture and awareness bit. Um, emotionally, I'm tempted as Panagenda to say from tomorrow on, you know, let's prevent uh, people from attaching um, files to emails, because that would fix one of these issues. Um, the immediate question you get from sales is, yeah, okay, so how, how do we send, I don't know, um, offers um, to customers? So there's no simple fix to this. So you have to start with telling people whenever stuff touches personal data, um, you have to be all aware that you can't just spread this around like in the past, not thinking about it. There's another side to this, which is uh, referring to single source of truth versus multiple sources of truth. We'll get on that on the next page. And lastly, there's this big thing of transparency, where once, once again, let me emphasize, you have to clearly communicate when collecting personal data, what you do with that, all the stuff that we had on the, on the previous side, just as summing that up. Now, speaking of single sources of the truth or a single source of truth versus multiple sources of the truth, this is all about, uh, all about distributed storage. In many organizations, there's no such thing as one record per person or a customer or, you know, EU citizen. So it's not like there's just one database and nowhere else will you find a name, an email address or whatever for that one person. Uh, I do know some organizations where that is the case. Typically, they are smaller organizations because they then have either just SAP or just one SQL database and um, customer data is not stored anywhere else. 
in larger organizations, organizations, reality has it that you have the same person in the CRM, you have it stored across mail files, you have it stored in Excel sheets, you have it stored, I don't know, wherever else, so in many different places, which typically are the multiple sources of truth. So customer data is stored in many places. Um, what is a good rule of thumb is to think in implementing something that kind of bequeaths single source of truth down to multiple sources of truth. So think of it this way. There's one system in which you have customer data. It could be SAP, it could be a SQL database, it could be a notes database, and only there is where customer data lives. If it also lives in an Excel sheet, it needs to be synchronized on a regular basis. So in that sense, when you at some point have to delete a customer name, that you can then make sure that that deletion will replicate kind of into all other sources. Uh, and yes, I understand this is difficult, but I'm still trying to spell this out here because it's uh, something that we talk a lot, a lot about with customers where they're saying we have to actually change our current multiple sources of truth into this, there's a single source of truth and blend all processes into that. The much bigger elephant uh, around distributed storage is not so much where is that one customer data to be able to delete it or correct it, but it is stuff like screenshots, it's attachments, it's exported data, it's printing. So whenever anybody in a database creates a, a screenshot of the um, you know, list of customers, uh, attaches it to an email, you've just lost control to be later on able to delete that data, to correct that data, um, or um, do whatever is required um, from the data subject. The same goes for forwarding emails, copying emails, copying documents, easy in a notes database. You copy a document from the mail database into the CRM, and immediately you've got two copies of the same attachments, the same personal data. Um, that goes even further when you think about storing attachments in SharePoint, connections, email, network drives, local machines. Um, I think we've all been there that somebody applies for a job in your organization, it's sent to one central system. Could be Conexa, could be a mailbox, could be anything. Um, and from there, somebody in HR forwards that application to four people in the organization asking, how about this? If you're lucky, they just send a link. And so you just have one uh, source, single source of truth where all the application data is only in that database. Uh, I strongly believe that there's lots of organizations that would just forward this by email um, at some point during the process. Now you forward it to four people, those four again forwarded to another two, and you've just lost full control of the personal data of an applicant. That goes even further when people download and store on network drive or local machines. Now, um, let's also take a quick look at of what po possible data breaches are anyway. And, and in most cases, people think in a hack or an attack. Um, that's one thing. But the other thing is just mere sharing of information. Uh, I think before the GDPR becomes effective, um, how often would we just take an extra sheet with customer data in it and share it with, I don't know, a business partner because we jointly work on fulfilling a contract? Or um, we would share it between countries because, um, you know, there's uh, Penagent Germany and there's Penagent Inc. as one particular example. Uh, don't take this as penitent taking any of this lightly. I'm illustrating things, um, you know, how things um, could be or uh, might have been. Uh, yes, we're struggling with some of this too, but we're heavily working on it. And believe me, we're in the uh, best process of uh, getting this GDPR thing done for penitent as well. The next thing is insufficient protection of information. So, um, you know, think of you have a roller desk um, on, on, on your desk, a roller desk with customer data. So now we're not talking digital information, we're talking printed customer data on paper cards. Or, um, you know, you, you have a filer in which you store customer data in, in printed source and you store it in a cupboard right behind you without any locks. Depends obviously on the personal information, but it's insufficiently prote protected. Uh, again, you have to make clear in case of a data breach or when being um, audited um, that you are taking all possible measures across all processes and pieces of information that you sufficiently protect them. The next one is transporting information without sufficient protection. This is a great example because one of the questions that often pops up is, do I now have to encrypt all email communication with all parties that I communicate with? In my opinion, that would be great, but as difficult as it is to say, it's not necessary state of the art. State of the art meaning it's not like everybody does it. So company to company, company com com communication between two organizations that uh, don't belong to a larger you know, uh, organization typically is uh, 
well, I send email and it's sent to a provider and the provider again sends it somewhere else and that's typically not encrypted. As long as that is a state of, um, uh, state of the art kind of, or, or what you would call it, um, then you don't necessarily have to do that, but you should think about it. Exchanging information with third parties or across con uh, country borders or stuff like that, that would perfectly be an example where you should review um, whether you're doing uh, the best to actually protect the data. Uh, simple things like uh, losing a USB stick. Um, so, you know, uh, without it being properly protected. And most organizations, the larger ones I know of, you can't even use a USB stick, um, except for a few people. Those need to be documented. Or as soon as you use a USB stick, it's automatically encrypted. Two solutions. If you have the, if you're amongst the third ones and, um, you know, um, uh, until, Recently, we've been the same at Pen Agenda. You could just stick a USB stick anywhere and it would be protected. That's not really properly handling such information. The next thing would be less of a loss of a laptop um, or a mobile phone. We all know that uh, there's the statistic one out of five mobile phones gets lost. Um, and whether that applies to you, there's still a high amount of number of mobile phones that do get lost. And if they're not sufficiently protected, bad. Loss of printed material, so just again making the point clear, this is not just about digital information, uh, but it is um, it, personal information stored in a file system. And file system isn't Windows Explorer operating system file system, but is any structured, um, you know, use of data. Um, what I wouldn't do now is say, well, let's then not structure it, but just put it somewhere and let's not care about it. Um, apart from that, that most organizations have to structure it anyway. Um, lastly, it's stuff like wrong access. So you have to be aware in case of a data breach, you have to prove who all had access to this. Uh, was it like default equals reader um, or stuff like that? Or did you make sure that only five or 10 people specifically had access to that particular uh, information? Did you instruct people not to forward personal data um, outside of the scope of the systems where you maintain it? Um, next to that would be misuse of access. Um, so that's again one. And then lastly is this hack attack stuff. Now, I only have one slide where I just want to quickly touch the, you know, how Penetrant can help with this. Um, again, I, I don't want to make this a product presentation. In an ideal world, you might be interested in covering some of uh, what we talked about now um, with a little bit of help. Uh, and I'd love to go into more detail uh, on either each of the products or at least the combination of them. You can t talk for another hour or two to make it more clear. I'm just trying to highlight this here. Um, amongst our portfolio is uh, Security Insider, um, which helps you document um, who has what kind of access to what. Um, and that also goes from moment in, uh, of installment uh, throughout the entire history. So Mr. Miller currently is reader in this database and three weeks ago um, he didn't have access to the database. Um, so changing access over time and being able to document it both across history as well as right now. That also helps with understanding how many databases do you actually have where default is not no access. A recent study by um, um, PricewaterhouseCoopers revealed that in many organizations, 40% of all information is not sufficiently secured. It's like default access, everybody um, can read information or whatever. So this has to be tuned down or you have good reason why everybody needs read access to everything or to a lot of stuff. The next thing would be connections expert working around IBM connections where you could help, uh, where you can um, understand who works with whom. Obviously all the products have more than what I'm telling you about. I'm trying to specifically relate to GDPR. Why could it be important for you to understand who works with whom? This again is, I believe that on May 25, you can't just say it's impossible for anybody to share personal data with the wrong people. So if you first need insight into your organization to understand that it's not what you thought that marketing shares data with uh, another department, but there's obviously seven departments working with Excel sheets around customer data. Um, we're looking at both the attachments people upload and download and working, looking at which departments work together across or in certain communities is of vital importance because it, later on documents, you did everything to understand how the organization works to implement countermeasures um, and to infuse culture. 
The next thing, uh, uh, more precisely, who shares information with externals? If you have external connections users, you might upload, I don't know, customer data, personal data into a community, uh, and maybe there's files, extra sheets up there that you weren't aware of uh, being shared with the external world or being at risk of being shared with the external world. That's the other thing is, is there a lot of um, content related to personal data and connections? Do you know? If not, Connections Expert can help. Next ones are IDNA Foundation and Application Insights that can help you um, identify who accessed what when. So where a security insider tells you 300 people were able to actually access database XYZ, um, IDNA Foundation and Application Insights can tell you, well, who effectively accessed that database, which especially in a default access um, being different from no access scenario is of vital importance. If 30,000 people in your organization can access a certain database, then maybe it's good to know who actually accesses in order to be able to tune that access down. Uh, next one is IDNA for email. Again, who communicates with whom? In the easiest sense, you might want to understand which internal employees communicate with the outside world. Yes, you could say, well, that's going to be everyone, but you'd, you could want to cluster it by domain. You could want to correlate it against SAP to understand which of those are third parties that, again, operate with our data. You could want to take it a step further to analyze for attachments, which emails are exchanged that contain Excel sheets or stuff like that to, again, uh, get a better understanding and control over personal data floating around in your organization. Other things are understanding which emails are encrypted between parties. So is there a lot of traffic between, I don't know, the board of management and the HR department that's encrypted, but there seems to be a lot of traffic between HR and other departments that suddenly isn't encrypted. Understanding whether emails are automatically created versus um, through human beings, um, which may be important where you want to gain an understanding there's this bot that sends out, I don't know, Excel sheets or whatever, and apparently that has external recipients to it. Next things are around Marvel client managing local replicas. Uh, local replicas, think of it that way. Many companies have a CRM that's based on nodes, if it's not the CRM, but just some other databases that touch personal data, and you are obliged to delete someone, then you have to make sure that all local replicas are in sync with that central deletion. So making sure that all local replicas are regularly replicated. Being aware of how many people actually have local replicas of certain data con containing personal data. Controlling things like who has which desktop icons and bookmarks. So just making sure that the entire user population is properly linked to your server household. And lastly, there are smart changes that can help you with changing or deleting um, names slash content. So if you're obliged to delete the name of a person from a text list or stuff like that for select databases, you can have smart changer help with that. So you could design a process that whenever there's a deletion happening, that smart changer makes sure that across your notes databases, that deletion is also happening similar to uh, a change. Um, lastly, I just want to quickly cover um, a couple of important resources that you may want to um, take away from this. First of all, the before mentioned Privacy Shield website um, uh, on the US Department of Commerce, where you can just look up um, an organization and understand whether it is certified under the EU um, Privacy Shield. Um, there's also, by the way, a, uh, a Swiss Privacy Shield, um, which is also um, I think happening, um, I wasn't even aware until doing the search today um, about the, the Swiss Privacy Shield and all honesty, so another quite exciting thing here. You will notice that um, those companies can either be certified for HR data and or non-HR data. Uh, IBM, Microsoft, Salesforce and a lot are all certified for pretty much non-HR data. That sounds silly at first because you could argue first name, last name is you know HR data or um, maybe even the department name and stuff like that. Now we're talking about stuff like, I don't know, account number to you know uh, make sure you get your salary or birth date, uh, age, um, sex, stuff like that. Um, that that is typically HR data, and that's where the, uh, they make a big difference. <clears throat> um, also, uh, for the most part, when you read up on Microsoft or IBM's website, in the majority of cases, they claim to be the so-called data processor, as we learned earlier, when it comes to their cloud services. Quite obviously, they're just as much a um, data uh, controller, uh, at least IBM in Germany and Microsoft in Germany. So the entities in European countries um, are also um, data um, controllers. Uh, 
that being said, um, and by the way, um, one of the companies that I mentioned, Facebook earlier, Salesforce, la la la, uh, Mailchimp, all of them you can find there. The one that you don't find there is Hootsuite, and that's because it's Canadian. Um, so don't expect it on the website of the US Department of Commerce. So if you don't find it there, it may very well be that you're looking at a third party that you work with, um, um, and it's not based out of the United States, um, then you may have to look at different sources for different countries. Um, and not all countries may have an agreement with the EU. I know the US has Canada, uh, there's infrastructure in place, um, not necessarily every country in the world. Um, next one is uh, my personal favorite. I pretty much read up all the text on this website, gdprinfo.eu, which contains all the 84 articles. Every article also has um, other text behind it that explains stuff differently, what the, um, the lawmakers kind of thought when creating that and um, what certain things mean in more detail. So it's like 84 paragraphs um, and doubling them out with all the explanations. Um, here you have this really great infographic that I'm specifically not giving out in a readable form here because, well, I would have asked for permission, but when you click on that, um, then um, you can actually look at that one particular infographic, which is great once you've understood pretty much everything that I just talked about now. Um, in the beginning, I hoped I could do a presentation just with this one slide and then just explain images like, and you know, say, this is easy. But then I was looking at some of the stuff and went like, well, how's that? And what comes in? So I had to read through all the stuff and compile the 60 minutes. Uh, lastly, one more um, from the European Union itself uh, on GPR, um, one more resource. Uh, that's pretty much it. So I'd be opening up for questions. Thank you for being with us today. Um, we would love to hear from you in case you want to carry the subject further or have any questions, which you can either ask now or at any time after the session. Thank you very much, Florian, for all the information. Um, it was a lot of information that uh, you need probably a little time to absorb. There is, though, one thing that I'd like to clarify, um, that the EU GDPR is, in fact, an EU regulation, and each EU member state has its own uh, That means that not necessarily all the information that you heard today is applicable to each and every EU country, for example, the exception for record processing activities for organizations uh, with fewer than 250 employees is in fact relevant to Germany under the BDSG, that's the Federal Data Protection Act, but not, for example, Austria under the DSG, which is the Data Protection Act. Uh, in Austria, that means records for processing activities is always required in the case of an inspection. Um, so with that, despite uh, the detailed information you received today, it's still a very complex subject and we still recommend that you seek legal advice should you feel that you need it. Um, right, so we'll jump into some Q&A. We've got a number of great questions, some of which are similar to one another, so I've tried to combine them to cover as many as possible. Um, if you have any more, though, by all means, keep them coming. I'm keeping an eye, keeping an eye on the question panel. Uh, the first question I'd be happy to cover. The question was, what if I am a US company employing an EU citizen? Do all these rules apply to me? Now, this is something that we cannot stress enough. The short answer is yes. Um, but if I quote the wording in the GDPR regulation, it says, it, uh, referring to the GDPR, applies to all companies processing the personal data of data subjects residing in the European Union, regardless of the company's location, end quote. That means all companies that sell to, work with, hire, etc., any EU citizen. Uh, it's a good question because from what we've gathered, it's not yet commonly publicized in countries outside the EU, for example, the US. Um, so make sure that you share this webinar with any and all relevant colleagues. Um, and of course, if they have questions, then they can also ask them directly per email. Um, now, no, you didn't want to make it a product webinar, Florian, but the interest seems to be there as the following questions are Panagenda product based. So I'll let you answer those. Um, the first is, do Panagenda solutions help document the process for me? Um, 
It, I'd say so. Uh, very frankly, put uh, the the process per se, we don't document. So think of it this way: where security inside it will tell you uh, the person has this particular access. How that access came about uh, as part of the overall process um, wouldn't be documented. But um, the change of access, um, or the grant of access, or the disk grant of access, that naturally would be documented over time. And the same applies to other products. So the the human process part. Uh, naturally, the products per se don't uh, document. What they all do is they collect and um, aggregate or, or store all the necessary data um, in order to answer the relevant questions around GDPR as to who has access to what, uh, when did that person have that access or no longer have it, um, who um, shared information with whom, and similar things. So I, I would say depending on how you understand the word process, I would say yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think the following question stems from the slide that uh, listed all the products that were relevant. The question is, if we utilize multiple Panagenda products, is there any kind of bundle or service package? Quite certainly, and that would be wonderful if we can pick that up in, in a discussion afterwards, whether with me or with one of my sales co colleagues or consulting colleagues, um, just uh, going into the conversation. Um, the easy rule of thumb, thumb is the more, the better for all parties involved. Fantastic. And the final question, is there a trial licensing option for Panagenda tools where you can gain insights in advance or make initial assessments? Yes, pretty much all products allow for eval licenses, which uh, either have a time component to it, so I don't know, a week or two, uh, or, or a similar, um, or they have a component to it uh, looking at a subset of the data, because even uh, in, in giving you know full insight on um, all possible access and communication streams inside of an organization um, for a week would even be massive. So we typically then go for sub license scope um, to get a good first understanding of the product. Fantastic. That covers all the questions we have. There's no new ones in the panel as such. So that brings us to the end of the webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Um, remind you to keep an eye on our webinar page for all upcoming webinars, including uh, one of the next ones, uh, sneak preview of Panagenda's Office Expert for MS Office 365. That's on the 28th of February with its product manager, Stefan Fried, um, where you'll also find all the recordings for past webinars, including today's. Um, yeah, today's presentation was recorded, will also be shared with all the attendees in a follow-up email. And Florian, I'll give you the final word before ending the webinar. I'll just say thank you for having us today and uh, spending the time with us. Uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from you, seeing you soon. And thanks a ton. Till soon.